Hello, and welcome to the second installment of AP World History with Ms. Muir and Mr. Yarswich. Today our topic is Key Concept 1.2, the Neolithic Revolution and Early Agricultural Societies. You may recall that our, our last video talked about the Paleolithic Age, and we said Paleolithic meant Old Stone Age. Well, this video is going to be about the Neolithic Age, or the New Stone Age. Uh, you might be wondering, what's so revolutionary about the New Stone Age? Uh, it's not like they made any new stones. <laughs> Uh, stones were all the same. Uh, the revolution here is based around agriculture. In some cases, what they used the stones for, really. Yeah. Um, so one thing that happened about 10,000 years ago on planet Earth, um, you know, one of the many, many. <laughs> um, was the end of the old ice age. So what was happening on planet Earth was a global, sort of a global warming, right? Warming temperatures and melting glaciers. And this transformation in the, uh, the, the Earth's climate in many places um, led to a change in the kinds of plants and animals that were available to uh, the hunter-foragers. So what we saw as some of the, the larger game animals that humans had been hunting for a long time started to die out, right? Because animals can't exactly adapt to new climates the way that humans can. And they were being hunted, too. So yeah, that's true. <laughs> as right, the animals right. are struggling for food and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and ecosystems, they're, right. they're also being eaten. Yes. Uh, so as the animals are dying out, um, and, and also the climate was changing to allow for different kinds of vegetation to grow, uh, humans really had uh, faced the challenge of finding new sources for food. Um, so we're going to look at two different kinds of agricultural societies. Um, the first one we're going to talk about are the places that farmed. So in this map, what you see are these little purple blotches. Um, for example, here in Africa, the Fertile Crescent, China, etc. These are places where agriculture was developed independently. So what that means is the humans that were living there actually figured out how to farm on their own. No one was first, but no one was unique either. Right. Uh, the arrows on the map represent the path that the knowledge of agriculture spread. Um, so you may be wondering, how does agriculture spread? Um, there's pretty much two ways. Uh, on the one hand, literally agriculture spread as farmers turn to new areas for cultivation, uh, thus increasing the size of the farmlands. Um, and another way that agriculture, the knowledge of agriculture spread was by uh, transmitting that knowledge to nomadic groups. Okay, we'll talk a little bit later about those kinds of groups, but basically you have nomadic groups um, coming into contact with the settled farmers and then take learning the knowledge and then spreading it to other places. And this maybe a third way too is uh, just plain old migration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if the rain shift, if there's an extended period of drought, um, groups may go out and uh, found new societies, uh, new farmland, and, and bring that knowledge with them as well. Exactly. Uh, important takeaways here to understand that um, it turns out it was really hard to figure out how to farm. It took humans thousands of years to figure out how to do this. Um, it's always interesting to think about, well, how did humans figure out how to farm? It's not like they woke up one day like, oh, I know what to do. Um, basically, it starts with the domestication of plants and animals. Um, in this slide, you see uh, the ancestor of corn, okay? It used to look like this. Um, and then we have sort of an intermediary stage, and then this is corn as we know it today. Um, and the selection process is pretty simple. Uh, humans simply picked and then replanted the crops that gave bigger yield, um, thus eventually uh, leading to the development of plant, the, the, the fruits and vegetables that we eat and love today. They were essentially genetic scientists. They were, okay. They were ex definitely... The, first, the very first. Yeah, experimenting with different kinds of techniques. Uh, we also see a similar process with the domestication of animals. Uh, animals that were maybe more violent or less willing to do what you tell, you know, less willing to stay within a fenced in area or, or, you know, follow direction and whatnot, tended to be the animals that were slaughtered for food and skins, where the more docile animals tended to be kept alive and used for breeding. Um, so what we see is, again, over the period of thousands of years, um, these animals became domesticated and, and more like the animals that we know today, the cows, pigs, goats, chickens. And pets. And pets. Right. Yeah. And if any of you have ever seen a litter born or know about that, um, you know that each animal in a litter has a different temperament, a different personality. Well, that's Humans figured that out and that really led to uh, the domestication of animals around the world. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let's take a, a look again at this map. Um, again, I just want to make sure that you understand you are responsible for, uh, for knowing um, and being able to give examples of where agriculture developed independently. So that's these purple areas blotches. Uh, probably the most talk, the, the one that we'll talk about the most is here, the Fertile Crescent. Um, wouldn't you say that's I say that. And, <laughs> and China, it becomes important in China, too, because sure. they're sort of independent um, in a lot of ways, less mm -hmm. contact uh, with them. And, you know, if you remember, there's a very similar map we looked at in Key Concept 1.1, um, and that showed people all over the world. These arrows show where agriculture spread, but people were already there. They right. just, they were hunter-foragers still. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really, as agriculturalists spread, hunter-foragers had three options. They could join them, uh, they could fight them, or they could flee them. And fighting wasn't very good because, remember, those kinship bands were very small. Right. And agricultural societies sustained a much larger population. Um, so as agriculture spreads, it's pushing out uh, hunter-foragers uh, from these territories. Mm -hmm. So uh, the second type of... Uh, agricultural society that depends primarily on uh, domestication of animals was called pastoral society. Typically, agriculturalists specialized. You know, either mm -hmm. you focused on plants and plowing in fields, or you focused on herding animals. Um, and here you can see two really important animals. Um, the horse, which is really useful for being able to move faster than your flock and to herd them and keep them together, um, as well as to move uh, long distances without having to walk. Um, and uh, the goats themselves. And goats and sheep, they gave wool, they gave milk, cheese, mm. fermented milk, yeah, fermented. if you like that sort of thing, <laughs> um, and of course meat. Um, let's see, and some pastoralists, uh, became they're, they're mobile by nature, but some of them would travel very long distances, and we see this across the steppes mm -hmm. of Central Asia. Um, and nomadism means just Did you know that, that any good nomad comes from the steppes of Central Asia? Any good nomad? Any good nomad. And we will, Fun fact, uh, kids. we will find a lot of good nomads uh, in period three. <laughs> <laughs> Preview. Um, nomadism uh, was what, nomadic groups were what Ms. Mir said was earlier, were connecting settled societies and spreading knowledge, spreading goods. Um, here you see cattle being driven by um, nomads on horses. This, I think, is in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. right. The choice of specializing in pastoral nomadism or uh, agrarian settled society really wasn't a choice. Uh, right. In, in a lot of ways, it was determined by the environment. Sure. You know, if you don't have any goats in the area, you can't raise goats. Right. And, <laughs> Good point. Right? And in the Americas, for instance, there were no beasts of burden. What is the beast of burden again? A beast of burden is something that you can, an animal that you can make do work for you. Yes, and they're don't, carrying heavy loads. Don't want to be your beast of burden. You don't want to be my beast of burden. That's right. Um, oh wait, there's one exception. Yeah. We we can't forget the gentle llama the gentle of the Andes. Mm -hmm. um, but llamas are actually small, and the Andes are mountainous, and they're more practical as a pack animal. Yeah. Um, they're not really structured. I guess is the best way to say that. Um, to to actually perform labor in the way that an ox or a horse much can, bigger right can animals. perform labor on the farm. Right. In ag settled agricultural societies, uh, it's a lot of work to farming. If any of you know any farmers, they're, they're always working, especially during the harvest, planting and harvest seasons. Mm -hmm. um, and the land is not ready-made for farming, especially as it spreads and grows. So humans have to work together cooperatively to clear land, either you know, slash and burn art, you know, agriculture, cutting down trees, um, or uh, dredging out uh, marshlands, mm -hmm. or trying to control the flow of water through irrigation systems. You know, here you can see a rice paddy. Um, rice requires irrigation. Um, it needs to be flooded. Yeah. And that takes a lot of labor, a lot of massive labor. And labor that's coordinated requires someone to coordinate it. And uh, so cooperative work, in a way, is going to help lead to coordinated work, which means someone's in charge and somebody's doing the hard work. Mm -hmm. This marks the creation of more... Uh, stratified social mm -hmm. systems, unlike the kinship the, bands. Right, the egalitarian, egalitarian societies we talked about earlier. That's Absolutely. Right. That's right. And there are some negative effects that come with agriculture. Not everything is perfect. Um, with animals, for instance, uh, living in close proximity with lots of animals um, and their feed and their dung, 
um, leads to a lot of diseases spreading and crossing over. Mm -hmm. And you know some of them. Chicken pox, uh, cow pox. Bird flu? Much later. Too but soon. yes, too, too soon, soon, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's going to be part of it. Uh, for irrigation system, you know, irrigation can overwork the land, um, you know, and it can lead to erosion if there's if it's prone to flooding, mm -hmm. topsoil being drained away. Um, in coastal civilizations, salt water often leached into irrigated fields, and over hundreds or thousands of years would salinate, add salt to the soil, ruining it for agriculture reducing yields. Mm -hmm. um, and, and more broadly speaking, there is a uh, an interdependence of humans and the plants and animals that they depend on. You know, they've created these plants and animals by selective breeding, um, and now they're stuck with them. You, know, you, can't, you can't go back. You need the food <laughs> that comes with, with that. And, and the animals do not know how to fend for themselves anymore. Right, either. right, exactly. So this is a fundamental transformative time in human history. Um, and besides this new, um, this new thing of humans purposefully altering their environment, uh, we also see some other uh, really significant transformations. Uh, one thing is that um, food production um, leads to the development of surplus agriculture. So when you have a surplus of agriculture, that means you have extra food, right? Everybody has enough food, and then there's more, and that more food can be saved for later. Um, and what that tended to mean for these early agricultural societies was that they started to settle down in one place, right? They didn't need to follow their food source anymore. Uh, what you see here is an image of a Neolithic farming um, settled society um, and it, it, well, it's a cartoon sketch of a, a mock-up, if you will, of what the society would have looked like. Um, and what you're seeing are these sort of box-like uh, dwellings, right? These are permanent houses, and they are grouped together into quite a large settlement, actually. Um, so that's one of uh, the significant transformations, then, is um, not just humans settling down in one place, but also the population size growing and the, the population density growing. Um, again, because of the food surplus, um, if you have enough food and then some to feed everyone, that means not everyone has to be involved in the farming. Some people have time to do other things. And if you kind of look around this picture, you can see people engaged in other kinds of activities. Um, for example, some people were free to develop skills in pottery and making um, jars and vessels to store grain, to store, uh, you know, beer was beer was popular. Beer was a, beer was a thing was back an then. Important drink. And, and not just functional things, too. Yeah. Remember, sure. the, you know, the Paleolithic peoples would create art. Sure. Um, and, and Neolithic peoples are no different, and so lots of artisans and... Yeah, as, again, at any, when, you know, you guys know that the more you practice something, the better you get at it. So as these specialized workers uh, really develop their skills, these, even everyday items, begin to become more and more decorative in nature. Um, so we have people working in pottery, people specializing in making tools and weapons. We start to see weapons become, and tools and weapons become more refined, um, more effective, uh, we also have uh, specialized workers in the form of warriors, right? People whose job it is to protect the society. Uh, we see the um, extremely specialized worker of the uh, political leader, right? Somebody has to organize everyone else in terms of, of labor that needs to be done. Uh, and so even though there were specialized workers in the society, um, definitely by far it's important to keep in mind that most people still uh, were farmers, right? The vast majority of the, of the population here um, of people were farmers. Okay, um, and moving along here. So since, again, uh, this new development of farming led to settled societies, and since these uh, villages developed that were settled, uh, there grew a need for protection. So when, once okay. you have lots of stuff, you got to yeah. worry about people coming to take it. Exactly, it becomes an, an, an easy target if it's undefended. Right. If you have a permanent a permanent house, allows you to accumulate wealth, um, versus hunter forager or uh, more nomadic societies where if they're always moving around. They're going to take. They have to take their possessions with them. So you didn't see this accumulation of lots of possessions. But with settled societies and actual, you know, private homes. Um, you start to see this, this accumulation of, of wealth, um, 
you know, uh, furniture, tools, clothing, that kind of thing. Um, so now you have to protect it. Um, and we mentioned earlier that, that some people became a speci specialized in the protection of society, right, the warriors. Um, and one thing that these settled villages did was to develop defensive walls. So you see in this image of a hypothetical Neolithic settlement um, that has a series of two defensive walls. And actually what you can see is uh, people attacking the, yeah. <laughs> those defensive walls. And it's not, not <laughs> coincidental that this has been shown on a hill. In fact, many mm -hmm. Neolithic and for actually... Uh, centuries yep. uh, long thereafter, um, you wanted to maximize your farmlands, right. grazing lands, and so the unfarmable mount rocky hills right. became the settlement sites. Yeah, it's very difficult to farm on a hill, yes. for sure. Unless you're in China, yeah, or Japan, yeah. or Japan, yeah, yeah. 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 in the Andes, in the Andes, in the Andes, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the right-hand side, what we see are some examples of Neolithic jewelry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with, with the development of people who specialized in certain kinds of jobs, you see their, their knowledge and skill and technique get better and better. And so these are some examples of fashionable necklaces um, that would have been seen in Neolithic settled societies. And as you said, you know, some small portion of society got, accumulated wealth and gained mm -hmm. status. They showed their status through things like jewelry or, um, you know, the, the stuff that they accumulated yeah. as well as the size of their, their dwelling and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, how they decorated it. Still true, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so this brings me to another transformation. Uh, and again, it's related to the fact that these villages were settled, right? Permanent villages meant that if, the, if your area, your village, didn't have access to a certain material or essential resource, you had to deliberately engage in long-distance trade in order to gain those resources. Uh, oftentimes, this long-distance trade was carried out by the pastoral nomads, right? These herding groups that would come through and um, trade off, you know, surplus herd animals um, or even goods that they had accumulated in some other settled town uh, in exchange for the goods that were available wherever they had traveled to. Um, so the pastoral nomads really played a very important role throughout this time period in transmitting um, not only these luxury goods and, and natural resources, but also um, in transmitting ideas and technology. Um, Some examples yeah. of those, uh, <laughs> those new, new technologies. Um, you know, we mentioned pottery, mm -hmm. um, some of it decorative, some of it uh, functional. Yeah. Um, um, and by the way, these are all specific examples that you need to be able to know, so you probably should, you know, write them down or jot some notes. Um, so, yeah, you need to know that the Neolithic Age technological advances are um, pottery, uh, the wheel and wheeled vehicles. Um, interestingly, uh, most of the time we associate wheeled vehicles um, with Mes Mesopotamia or Eurasia um, and we tend to think that in the Americas they had you know they didn't even invent the wheel um, and actually archaeological evidence indicates that the Americans the early Native Americans or Amerindians um, did know about the wheel um, we have found artifacts of like children's toys that have wheels on them um, it's just that they never put the wheel into practice in farming um, and probably that has to do with the fact that they didn't have these large beasts of burden in order to make a wheeled vehicle useful, like you see with the, uh, the horse here. A horse and an oxen can do it, a llama can. Right. And that's just it. Um, one of the most important advances uh, in, in technology was the development of metallurgy, which is a fancy word for knowledge of how to work with um, metal. Uh, the big metal in this time period, right, right, sort of this transitional period out of the Neolithic age into the age of first civilizations uh, was bronze. And so here you have a picture of a bronze um, knife or dagger uh, from Mesopotamia, I think. Right? Yeah, this is uh, Sumerian. Cool. In addition to metal weapons, uh, the plow is probably the, uh, the other really important technological uh, development um, for a couple of reasons. Plows enabled uh, agricultural production to increase. Um, the same lands, by being plowed, could produce more food. So you didn't just have to expand outward. You were right. improving your productivity within. And that leads, of course, to more people, or um, it can be traded, um, and uh, surplus food becoming a form of wealth, really, for, for agricultural mm -hmm. societies. 
Um, but there's another reason too, and if, in this this image, you'll notice that it's a man pushing that plow. And if you look at Neolithic art uh, that shows farming, it's it's almost always men pushing that. And mm -hmm. what happened was somehow somewhere between 10,000 years ago and about 3,000 years ago, uh, <laughs> men took over almost all of the production of food. This is really interesting because um, in the Paleolithic age, it was it was women who. Uh, were preoccupied with anything having to do with plants, right? Women were the foragers and gatherers of, of the plant materials that people ate. And they probably were the ones to discover how to domesticate plants and how to plant them. And, mm -hmm. and you know, they provided something like 70% of the diet of Paleolithic mm -hmm. peoples. Well, now they're providing hardly anything. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, the advantage of having larger families. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kids can be put to work. Yes. Yeah. Like when you have to do your chores. Yeah. <laughs> free labor. <laughs> free labor. Kids, you, kids are free labor. You are free labor. Yeah. Um, and uh, as women are pregnant more often in settled societies, they're unable to do that. You can't. You're not going to push that plow in the heat of summer, uh, pregnant. No, I wouldn't. No. You <laughs> All right. So uh, that's that's one of the reasons. Um, and the a consequence of that really is that as women are no longer produ productive members of the economy. Um, they really tend to get to lose social status, mm -hmm. and this creates uh, a social structure called patriarchy. It's a fancy word for a society that, in which men have power over mm -hmm. women, um, yeah. and really women are in many of these societies really become hardly valued more than the beasts of burden. Um, you know, and we're going to see some extreme examples of that when we look at the first civilizations mm -hmm. next week in Key Concept One Point Three. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.